chapter 5, verse 1 to, 15, 1 to 11. Acts chapter 5, verses 1 to 11. And we are in the Led by the Spirit series. And uh, we're reading from chapter 5 this morning. Let's read responsively. So I read uh, the odd verses, number of verses first. This is the Word of God. But a man named Ananias with his wife, Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? All it remained unsold, did not remain your own. And after it was sold, said so not at your disposal. Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. When Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last, and great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young man rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an internal, uh, uh, interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She said, yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husbands are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young man came in, they found her dead, carried her out, and buried her inside and together. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Amen. I'd like to share a story that I heard from another pastor. Uh, he witnessed uh, these uh, teenagers, these high school kids who uh, apparently were not Christians and they went out to the suburbs, they drove, and then they had a great time on Sunday. Uh, they had a wonderful Sunday and, you know, as things go, you know, they didn't want to go to school Monday, Blue Monday, so they didn't want to go. So one of them um, conjured up the plan, a plan, and uh, they said, let's agree upon this plan. How about if we tell our teacher tomorrow, uh, well, first of all, we can't miss the whole day. So we will go in at the very last hour of all the classes and tell him this story. We'll say we had a, a fun, wonderful time at the suburbs with a couple of friends, uh, but our car broke down. In fact, the tire, we got a flat tire puncture, and we didn't have the tools to, to repair it. So what we ended up was doing, we, we, we conjured up what we could, uh, we gathered up, and we tried our best, and we, we barely made it back to the city right now, at this afternoon. So this was the story that they uh, created. And so the next day, in fact, they had a wonderful time, another day of rest and of recreation and fun and joy, and then they had to go back to class. They couldn't miss the whole day. So they went to the teacher and told, them, told him that story. And to their surprise, you know, he had a big smile and say, Sure, that can happen. Yeah, you guys, uh, I'm glad you're back. He was really cool about it, right? And uh, just when they thought they were off the hook, he, uh, he said, hold on, I'll give you these post-it notes. I want you to sit here, there, 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 all split. And write for me which tire, the right side or the left side got punctured. And uh, they had a little quiz there. Um, you know, a lie can go so far lie will never go undetected. There are no perfect crime in this world, especially if you are a Christian. If you are a person of God that has the Spirit of God, or even though no one else in this whole wide world, it's just you, maybe you are the only witness of something, and if you lie, nobody will know, right? But the Holy Spirit who is in us, He knows. He witnesses. He is, in fact, says the Spirit he sees all things, even in the souls of our hearts. He knows all things. So there is no deceiving. There is no tricking. There is no lying to the Holy Spirit. We have been looking into the series of the Spirit of God, being led by the Spirit of God. And last week, we saw how the Spirit gives us the confidence 
to the boldness to live out in faith. We also saw how the Spirit, as a community, He gives us generosity as a fruit of the confidence and our devotion to our Lord Jesus Christ. And that same Spirit who dwells in us not only gives us the boldness and gives us the fruit of the Spirit, which is a lot, a lot of joy and generosity and so many other things, that same Spirit watches over us and He speaks to us and He warns us sometimes when He sees something that is not in His will, that is not pleasing to Him. We can never deceive the Spirit of God. And so the title of my message this morning is the testing of the spirit. The word of can mean a lot of things, right? It could be possessive, it could be subjective, it could be ob ob objective, so it could be like the testing of the spirit, the test that the spirit gives, is that what it means? But this morning it means that uh, we are the one who are, who are testing the spirit, so it's used in the objective sense. Uh, spirit is the object of our testing. We can end up testing the spirit of God if we're not careful. What does it mean to test the Spirit of God? We looked into this very famous story, but before we do, I want to refresh our memory a little bit. We've been looking at how the Spirit of God came upon the disciples of Jesus Christ who professed Jesus Christ as the Lord of all because He died on the cross for the sin and He resurrected and they truly saw Him, testified, witnessed, and the Spirit gave them boldness to live a very different kind of life. And the Spirit gave them a beautiful community where the needs were met. There was no needy in the community of God for the first time ever in human history. It was truly a utopian society, a community, and uh, they were excited for what God was about to do. And the Spirit of God was, so to speak, hovering over that community and blessing that community. But as all things on this earth, it was too good to be true, right? Satan, who is always jealous of the people of God, uh, uh, enjoying the blessing of God, he had to interfere. He had to put an obstacle in this community. In the most beautiful, at the most beautiful time, the most beautiful community, Satan turned something good into sour. And we saw last week, we saw a prominent name at the end of our story last week, the name of Barnabas. Uh, Brother Faisal, do we have the slides ready? Oh uh, yeah, Barnabas. It's just, uh, we don't know what it looks like, but just an uh, ancient painting of uh, what he might have looked like. Barnabas, who was the encom uh, encourager, comforter. And he will, his name will come up again and again and again in the book of Acts. This is the first time that we see his name. And he is a holy, spirit-filled man. He sold his wealth, his property, in order to meet the needs of the widows and the, the orphans in, the, in his community. And so we look at another couple this morning who had a similar heart but very different ending. And uh, their names are uh, Ananias and Sapphira, this couple. And uh, we look at this, th their story to understand what went sour in this beautiful community of God. Imagine with me a conversation that Ananias and Sapphira, Ananias is the man and Sapphira is the woman. Sapphira means like treasure. Um, uh, Ananias, uh, I forget what the name means. But uh, these were beautiful couple. They were people of God. And uh, they had this conversation. Maybe one of them uh, invoked uh, what's happening. They mentioned what's happening in the church. Hey, do you see all the beautiful things that people are giving for the poor and the needs are met? It's a, a wonderful thing that's happening. And uh, you know, so-and-so has given their property. They have sold that for, and they gave it to the disciples at the apostles' feet. It was late. And, uh, you know, the atmosphere is really good, and people around the community are, are really praising our church and all that. Hey, honey, how about we sell the property in front of our house that is actually, you know, just empty right now? We could sell that and uh, maybe give it to the church to be to, for the needs of the needy. And so uh, their heart was one and they decided to sell the land, uh, their property, and give it all to the, uh, to the church for the, the things of God. And uh, with that said and with that resolution, they actually sold the land. But uh, 
to their surprise, the amount they got was uh, more exceedingly than, than they imagined it would be. They didn't realize how over the couple of years the real estate has risen, the price has gone up, like here in Palo Alto. It's rising every day, it seems like. Uh, and uh, they had re- uh, noticed how much gain they had. And in, in their heart, there was this greed. You know, what if we take some for ourselves? And the Bible describes this as being saying, kept back for himself. They kept a portion of the proceeds of the selling of the land to themselves. The sad thing is this same, this is a very unique word, vocabulary here, kept something back. It's the same word that was used for Gesum. In the book of Joshua, it was used for Achan when he kept back some of the devoted things to God. So we can see Luke, who is author of the book of Acts, is, is intentionally using this vocabulary to catch, to, for us to catch the meaning here. And so what happens? They, in fact, go to the disciples, the apostles, and lay the, the, uh, the uh, money before their feet and say, this is what I've received for selling our precious land. The response for the church was, probably we're guessing, it was phenomenal. You know, they were saying, wow, Barnabas has given so much for the needy and the church and praise to God. And look, another beautiful couple has given so much to the Lord. And they would have been famous. They would have been uh, recognized in the church except for the fact one person knew the truth. One person, Holy Spirit, knew what was going in their heart. The spirit was not deceived. And we see in verses 3 to 4 of how Peter is confronting Ananias. He says that before you decide to sell the land, it belonged to God. And once you decide to sell and give all to him, it still belongs to him. And now you have taken some for yourself. And you have indeed, uh, you have taken back for yourself. And he says, why has Satan filled your heart? to lie to the Holy Spirit. He's accusing him of lying to God. And whenever he heard this, Ananias, the moment he heard this, it was immediate judgment for him. Very unique uh, event here. And he fell. His spirit left him and he fell dead. The young man came from the back and took his corpse and buried it. And when people heard this news, they were terrified. They were fearful of what God had done. What had happened? It happened so fast. I wonder if you caught what happened. It happened so fast that we have to wake Ananias up, so to speak, to ask him what had happened. If we were able to wake him up, I think Ananias would be a little bit upset. He'd say, it's unfair. You know, I had given so much to the church. I had given so much of my wealth to the Lord. You know, I could just have had not actually given anything, but I'd given so much. And the church benefited from this. God, you are unfair. What's going on? He might have defended himself like that. What would you say to Ananias this morning if, you, if he woke up from the dead and was complaining about what God had done? What would you say? What would I say? The Bible, we have to, as we read the Bible, we understand what had happened. I would tell Ananias, you just don't get it, do you? You know, it was not really about the amount of money, the, whether it was great or small. It was not about the fact that you even gave anything to God. It was about you deceiving the Spirit of God. You're telling, you've told him that you will give, this is everything that you have from the, pre- of, this is the proceeds of selling your land. But you have deceived, in fact, by taking back what is duly uh, given to him, you take it back for yourself. In fact, he was saying that you acted as if the Holy Spirit did not exist. To put in another analogy, I thought maybe we could think of like a situation where you're trying to buy something from a store, and you notice that the clerk is an older gentleman, and his eyes are, you think, are kind of dim. And so after, you know, the, the, the check, he uh, checks the price, and you're charged $100 for this thing that you've, uh, you're trying to purchase. And looking at, him, looking at him, you think, well, he's kind of you know, dim in his eyes, he's aged. I'm gonna give him a $20 bill, and maybe he won't notice. And uh, you try to give him a $20 bill. But uh, people are bright when it comes to money. They, they know how much it is. And so he rebukes you. How dare you try to trick me in giving me a $20 bill when I said 100? 
And maybe this is what the Holy Spirit felt like. Holy Spirit knew how much the land cost. Holy Spirit knew how much he had kept, the Ananias kept for himself. And he was saying, how dare you trick me? When I know the land is worth 100 units, you've given me only 80, saying that this is all. And Ananias indeed, he assumed as if the Holy Spirit was blind, or maybe even Holy Spirit wasn't there, but the Spirit was not deceived. To give some credit to Ananias, I believe, I think, this is all conjecture, that at some point in his life, in his church life, he was blessed by the Spirit of God. He also was touched by many people giving to the Lord, and he was challenged of, to do the same. In fact, that's why he gave in the first place, for this wonderful cause. But what had happened in the process from that filling of the Holy Spirit of, of being generous to this deceiving, ending up testing the Spirit? What had happened in the process? What had happened in his heart? And Peter, um, the Holy Spirit through Peter tells us what had happened. Going back to verse 3, he says, Why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit? A third outside source had stimulated him, had, had spoiled his heart. It says, Satan has filled your heart. In other words, without Ananias knowing, his, his heart was open. He gave an opportunity for Satan to attack his heart. And uh, before long, his heart was not full of the Holy Spirit. It was full of demons and the evil spirit. You know, maybe it's like this. Uh, you are thirsty at night and you get, go to the refrigerator and take the, the milk carton out. We talk about milk a lot these days, just last week too. Milk and you pour into the glass and you, you drink it. And you are happy and you go back to sleep. Only to find in the morning that you have forgotten put, to put the milk carton back in the refrigerator. And so you want to have another fresh cup of milk and you pour it into the milk, the cup, and you realize the, the milk is all sour, it's bitter, and, and it's no good. It's ruined, in fact. And that's what happens to fresh milk. It has to be refrigerated. When our hearts are outside the, the, uh, the presence of the Holy Spirit, the, so to speak, the refrigerator of the Holy Spirit, when our hearts are not preserved by Him, Satan, he always is like, like rushing waters, trying to seep into our lives, trying to find that opportunity to spoil our hearts, to, to ruin it, make it bitter, so that not the spirit, the fruit of the spirit comes out of my, our mouths and our lives, but complain and grudging and all these foul things come from our heart. If we are uh, laid back a little bit, if we are not careful, we give opportunity to Satan to attack our hearts. Indeed, uh, Peter says Satan is like a, 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 a lion who is about to devour its prey, looking for prey. It's hungry. It's looking for people to destroy. And I want to ask us a practical question. When are you, when am I most vulnerable to and, and, and be able to give opportunity to Satan. When are, where are those crevices and cracks of our heart that uh, make us fall sometimes and make us not filled with the Holy Spirit but filled with sin and other things that God does not desire? We could think about many things, many weaknesses in our faith as we liken our faith to a rock. You know, the, like we have to be stand fast steadfast like a rock, like solid, but there are cracks in our rock. We are incomplete. We are imperfect. And uh, going back to the Bible, especially the book of Ephesians, where it talks about the gospel and the practicality of the gospel, how we're to live out. The Bible, the book of Ephesians tells us some of those cracks that we need to be watching out for, that Satan uses as an opportunity to attack our hearts. Ephesians chapter 4 verses uh, 25 to 28 talk about these things. It's just a sample of among the many things that could, uh, are weaknesses in our hearts. 27 says, chapter 4 verse 27 says, and give no opportunity to the devil. Now, Ephesians is about Christians. It's about, it talks about be filled with the Holy Spirit. In fact, have the armor of God, you know, totally dressed and honored to fight the good fight. But in the middle of it, chapter 4, he talks about, do not give this opportunity to the devil. 
And what are those crevices in our lives? What are those gaps that give opportunity to, to Satan? Three things are mentioned, especially in this passage. It says, therefore, having put away falsehood, it's lying. Sometimes it seems advantageous to us when we say a little white lie. We're tempted. That's a little crevice. We don't intend to lie as Christians, but some situations, you know, somebody praises you and they have this false knowledge, and if you just agree, you know, you look good. You're tempted of, uh, to, to give falsehood. And another thing, it says, and uh, verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Um, do not let the sun go down upon on your anger. It says, yes, we can have this weakness of anger, but don't let it per persist in your life. Because anger can give an opportunity to Satan for you to sin. That's what he's saying. Verse 28, let the thief no longer steal, but rather uh, let him labor doing honest work with his own hands so that they, he may have something to share with anyone in need. There are people who habitually steal. You know, I was shocked once when I saw somebody steal something from Walmart right in front of me. So shocked, I didn't know what to do. I was just frozen. Uh, and then she had left. Um, I was so, so shocked. It was like many years ago. Some people are just in the habit of stealing. It is a, a crevice. It is a temptation that they cannot resist. And the, the scary thing is, it's just, it's not, it never just stops there. It is an a, a opportunity. It, it becomes a witch for Satan to come into our heart and fill us with uh, not the holy things, but wickedness and greed and for more stuff of this world. In fact, Ananias, how his heart was hijacked by Satan himself, just like Peter said, with this crevice, by this cre through this crevice of, of greed, both lying, falsehood, and also of stealing God's money. Brothers and sisters, why is this passage of scripture there for us? It is a warning for us Christians who have the Spirit of God, that the Spirit knows the most intimate things of our hearts. What you say, what you do, how you act. Nobody else might know your reactions at a particular time, but the Holy Spirit knows. And it says, do not deceive the Spirit. Do not test the Holy Spirit is, is the main message that Peter, in fact, the author Luke is trying to convey to us. Brothers and sisters, let us give no opportunity to Satan in our lives. Let us give him no opportunity in our lives. Oh, I forgot to show the picture, Brother Faisal. Um, just a picture of what I just described. Is it there? Of that uh, big rock. And um, there are these cracks in our lives that Satan just hammers his wedge into to crack our faith, to destroy us. That's what Satan does. He is the father of lies. He is here to steal, kill, and destroy. And Satan is always looking for that small opportunity to seep into our lives and put doubt, put greed in our hearts to fill our hearts with lies. Therefore, I have one application that I uh, want you to think about and, and uh, I encourage you to do. It is very simple. Look out for one another. Let's look out for one another. In the Bible, there is no magic secret formula to become suddenly holy and live like, you know, confident, faithful lives, never falling. Uh, we always fall. But God has given the community of God to the first century Christian, the church. He has given us a community. Why is that? For us just to go to a common cause? To follow God together? It's more than that. To look out for one another. That's why Hebrews chapter 10, 20, 24 says, spur one another on for love and good deeds. Encourage one another on for love and good deeds. For that to happen, we must look after, look out for my brother, look out for my sister. Because once we realize that there's a crevice of, in our faith, that there is this gap, it's too late usually. We notice it because we have sinned. But when somebody else sees us, sees our weaknesses, we can encourage one another to steadfast in the life of faith. So let's look out for one another. If there's a person at church who kind of dark, you know, uh, whose expression is dark, and you want to ask them, maybe text them quietly, are you okay? Just checking on you. If uh, there is somebody, a newcomer, and uh, they're a little bit uncertain, you want to look out for that person. They're here because they're seeking after God. They want to get closer to Him, just like you and I. 
And uh, our responsibility as a church is to look out for them, for all of us. I pray that our community, my church, our church would be a uh, watertight church, so to speak, looking out for one another, looking out for each other's uh, hazardous situation and, and uh, lifting them up, encouraging them. So Satan will have no foothold in this beautiful community of God. What is the testing of the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to test the Holy Spirit? It means you are giving an opportunity to Satan in your heart. And there's a second. What does it mean to test the Spirit of God? It means that it is an ignoring of the opportunity of the Spirit of God for you to repent and to obey. When the Holy Spirit speaks, it's being non-respondent. That is the testing of the Holy Spirit. You are testing the Spirit when you are non-respondent to the voice of the Spirit of God. And that's exactly what happened in the latter part of our story. Verses 7 to 8, we see, we find Ananias' wife, Sapphira, coming into uh, the Peter's presence, the church, probably. And uh, she, it has, three hours has passed. And she had no idea, no knowledge what had happened to her husband. And all of a sudden, Maybe she was a little bit joyful hearted, you know, she was praised by people and wow, this is Sapphira, she's such a holy woman, she's such a giving, generous person. But Peter's heart was not so joyful. In fact, it was heavy burdened, heavy hearted. And he had to confront her and ask this question, is this it? Is this all the proceeds that you received after selling your land? She must have been startled. Why is Peter all of a sudden asking about the price of this land. Have I not given enough? Many thoughts probably went through her mind. Where is Ananias? What's going on? Why is Peter, does he know something that he shouldn't know? What's going on? And he could have asked, she could have asked him why he's asking the question. She could have been more serious about this inquisitor. Many things probably went to her mind. And Peter was in fact giving her a last, only a last opportunity for her to confess what was truly going on in her life. But as you know the story, she rather hardens her heart, hardens her face, and says, yes, this is it. And the rest is history, right? And Peter can give her no more chance. She committed the same sin as her husband, and uh, Peter accuses her in uh, verse uh, 9, I believe. He says, look with me here. Uh, Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? So he is very explicit in saying, you are testing the spirit of God. You are violating uh, who God is, in fact. You are mocking him. You think he hasn't seen it. And uh, at that moment, just like her husband, her spirit left, and she died right there. And the young man, just like before, came and took her corpse away and buried her beside her husband. And the Bible says that this became a, a story that, was, that drove, uh, brought fear of the Lord in all the congregation of God's people. Yes, this story is thousands of years, years old. In fact, it's about 2,000 years old. And this was a truly a fearful event that happened to the first church uh, that God had created. And uh, I have to tell you, explain that this kind of story, this kind of event does not happen today that much. It's very rare. Even in, for the first church, this was a unique experience. We don't saw, see people falling dead inside the churches because of their offering, from, even from this point on. This was a unique experience. It was a uh, work of the Holy Spirit that was needed at the most important time for, um, the, in, the, in the life of the church. When the church was experiencing the Holy Spirit fullness and uh, the blessing and the, the, the grace of, of sharing love with, with each other, Holy Spirit had to cleanse His church of falsehood, of those people who are filled with lies and of the evil spirit. However, there is something that we need to take away from this passage for us today. It is this fact. It is that the person of the Spirit of God listens and obeys to the voice of God. A person of the Holy Spirit 
listens to the Spirit of God. Yes, we are weak. We always are fallible and we sin and we do things that we regret before the Lord. Yes, we sin. And whenever that happens, and whenever sometimes we can give an opportunity to Satan to rule over our hearts, and that happens, and, and, and the Holy Spirit intervenes. He speaks to our heart. He tells us this does not please him. But the most important thing is, how do you respond when that happens? What do you do when the Spirit is clearly convicting you of sin? When he reminds you of a passage of Scripture that, uh, that is against what you are doing, how you re react it. In, in some respect, maybe the Holy Spirit is asking in your heart, is this all the money that you, you receive from the selling of your land? Is this it? Isn't there more? When the Holy Spirit convicts us of us, I pray as a person of the Spirit of God that our hearts would be repentant and obey what he says. Because in fact, why is that? Because the whole, that's what the Holy Spirit does. The Bible says the Holy Spirit softens our hearts. Not like Sophia. Sophia was not of the Holy Spirit because she hardened her heart when she was confronted by the Spirit. But the person of the Spirit softens their heart. And we're reading through Ezekiel these days in the daily quiet time passages. I'd like to quote one passage, one verse from that passage we read last week. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 19. It's on the screen, hopefully, and let's read it together. 19, ready, go. And I will give them one heart and a new spirit I will put it within them. I will remove the heart of stone from their flesh and give them a heart of flesh. You know, when we're confronted, our immediate action, our sinful reaction is, no, I'm right. There must be some misunderstanding. You don't know what's really going on. We harden our hearts. But what's supernatural is about Christians is that the Holy Spirit, He softens our hearts and helps us to confess, helps us to come to the light, the truth of what really happened in our hearts. The Holy Spirit is a spirit who gives us the heart of flesh, indeed. And he gives us the flesh, a heart of flesh to, to repent of our wrongdoing and to obey what the Spirit says. And when that happens in our hearts, we call that led by the Spirit of God. We all sin. I sin. We all give an opportunity to Satan, but that's not the important thing. We all are fallible, but how do you respond to that when the Holy Spirit confronts you when we soften our hearts and ask the Holy Spirit to take over and once again lead us. He will indeed re lead us and he will fill us with his spirit. Uh, maybe you've seen this analogy before. It's found in the, um, you know, the four spiritual laws, gospel tract. And uh, Faisal, could you show us the, the train picture? You might think, I will be led by the Spirit. I will do what the Spirit says when I feel His presence. When I feel Him speaking to me, I will do this and that. How often does that happen to you? It does happen sometimes. But more often than not, like Sapphira, we know what we're supposed to do. The Holy Spirit has already spoken to us through His Word, and He reminds us of what is good, what is wrong what God is pleased by and what is displeased, what is sin and what is not. When we put to action what he says, based upon the faith we have in the word of God, well, it's what we know already, and we obey. In other words, for us to obey, we have to repent, by the way. You, don't, you can't just automatically obey because what God usually tells us to obey is something that goes against our nature. Do you want to love somebody that, that hits you on the right cheek? You can't do that, right? It's against our nature. Somebody that done you wrong, how can you forgive them? But when the Holy Spirit tells us, convicts us in their hearts to repent and obey, uh -uh. you are my son, you are my daughter, and I have a, per person, a, a plan for that person, why don't you respond as I say? As we repent our hearts, often our hearts, and, and uh, obey, what happens? Once we obey, feelings come. It's like the caboose. You know, the engine is what drives the train. The fact and the faith of the Word of God and obedient faith to our Lord. And then as we obey Him, God blesses our hearts. He helps us to fill, the, He fills our hearts with the Holy Spirit. And we can then say, we know that we are led by the Spirit of God. I have a confession to make. You know, I have a confession a lot these days <laughs> to you guys. 
um, as a pastor, you might be wondering, what is Pastor Joseph doing during the week? Right? I see him only on Sunday. That's because you only come on Sunday, by the way. <laughs> Not my fault. And so you might be asking you, what is he doing during the week? Well, I'm busy in my you know, own situation. I prepare for Bible studies uh, during the week, and uh, I lead uh, morning praise, uh, morning not praise, um, worship, uh, and I send it to you guys sometimes. Uh, some of you are receiving it, some of you are not. If you, if you want to let me know, I'll send it to you as well. And uh, make visitations, and uh, sometimes, you know, I have to be the janitor, and sometimes just look over the facility, something's broken, and, you know, all these things. And at the end of the day, I am tired. But there are times when my wife tells me, you know, uh, can we invite so-and-so to our house uh, for dinner? And my immediate reaction is, I'm tired. <laughs> Do we have to now? Although I love them to death and I really, you know, but my immediate fleshy reaction is, I have to lead service tomorrow morning. I have to prepare for this and something is coming up, you know, and all this. And, and that is my moment of little hesitation. I'm being just honest, truthful to you. And I remember uh, the Word of God. He reminds me, the Spirit of God reminds me. He has called me to look over your flock with watchfulness, with diligence. And uh, I have a choice at that moment. I could say, I'm too tired. Or I could obey my wife. Oh, I'm sorry, obey the Holy Spirit and uh, comply to what she says. And indeed, I do that. I repent, so to speak, change my heart, and obey. By the way, the Holy Spirit talks to us usually most of the time by a person of God close to you. Did you notice that? And then in Sapphira, the Holy Spirit didn't say in a booming voice from heaven, you know, why have you lied? It was Peter who confronted them. There are people around us as church members. It could be your spouse like me. It could be your, your kids sometimes. It could be your, your small group people who sees the crevice, who sees the weakness in our lives and says, this is right before the Lord. And it is your choice at that moment. Are you going to repent, so to speak, turn your heart? Or are you going to harden your heart like, like rock and say, you know, I have my reasons. I, I don't need to do that. But when you obey the Spirit, like I did this past week, and say, yes, Lord, do what you have to do. The result is when I put my faith in action, feelings follow. And I have the best evenings usually, most of the time with uh, spiritual conversations and praying for a brother or sister, and uh, we feel the Holy Spirit together. Brothers and sisters, what is the Spirit of God telling us this morning from Acts chapter 5? He is telling us to not give any opportunity of our heart to Satan. He is also telling us to repent and obey the Spirit whenever He leads us. And when He does, we will experience the same fullness of the Holy Spirit that they've experienced, and he will lead us into deeper spiritual waters than we've ever experienced before. But when we resist, we're always there. He's always waiting. So let's guard our hearts, watch over, look, over, look after one another, and uh, obey the Spirit of God this week. Amen? Let's pray. As I voice our... As